Welcome to another episode of the Funky Marketing Show. Today uh, we'll talk about the topics we didn't talk that much on, on this podcast. Uh, we have a guest, Taran Hughes, uh, somebody who I've been willing to have on the show for a while now. I don't know why we didn't make it happen before. But anyway, we're going to talk about sales mindset, sales enablement, uh, investment raise, deck developments, startup pitching, all those uh, nice, interesting stuff. So prepare your questions. Uh, but before that, uh, let's, uh, let's hear that funky intro and then we go. Taran, welcome to the show. Hello, and thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, so I've been thinking of how should I introduce you? And there are so many things to be said, just looking at your career and in sales, in telecommunications. Uh, but the, the thing where I first heard about you is when you started to do Pitch Slap with Zneb. So, uh, yeah. you know... So I decided, okay, that's, this is something interesting. And, and I love that approach around the uh, whole thing that you did together. We're going to talk about that as well. But uh, maybe it's a good thing that you sum it up a little bit of uh, who you are, where you're coming from, uh, and why you are here talking with me about this topic that we mentioned. Well, thank you very much. Who am I? Taryn. I'm from the UK originally, now living in Spain. I have been here for the last six years. I moved over for about half a year to finish writing my first book. That became a very long period of time. Uh, I wrote two books. I stayed because I like the climate and the weather and the food. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to meet some amazing people, one of which was Zineb, whom you just mentioned, who I met as a, when I was investing in a startup, actually. And she was a CMO, and then that didn't come to anything, but we ended up working together anyway later on, did a few little collabs, and then we came up with the idea of Pitch Lab, which came to us at the beginning of the pandemic, and um, we've, been, we've been firm friends for many years, and it's been incredible as a gateway into many different conversations and, and meeting new people like yourself too. Yeah, I think like it's incredible what one small let's call it a show or whatever it is do for you right uh, it doesn't have to be like fully produced fully edited it's just that you have that vibe around something that you're passionate about and you give value yeah yeah the product the production quality in the early days of the uh, picture weren't, weren't that high Zineb was in her apartment i was in mine and we were doing it over the internet but we cobbled it together but the key thing that made it's successful, and I define success as having, we had founders coming from 33 different countries. We had Pete, we had investors, we had, um, we had founders watching and listening from many, many different countries um, consistently for nine months when we were doing it as just a weekly show. So for me, that was the power of the value that we were delivering. And I think there was a desire and need to hear some of the things that we were saying. So I think we brought a fresh, fresh perspective to what pitching is about, because essentially it's sales and marketing. It's that beautiful marriage of both of those things. And when you demystify it, it becomes sequential and it's easy to execute. But I guess a lot of people, if they don't come from that background, it's just this sort of black hole of scariness that, you know, I've got to build a deck or I've got to pitch something and you try, I've got to tell you everything. And, and that's where it starts to unravel. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, uh, I've been working a lot with Impact Hub Belgrade and I've been in charge of getting early stage, even very early stage startups into the pre-accelerator they had over there. So I heard a lot of pitches and a lot of startups and there is really everything around there. So there's 
those that are actually startups, those that are not even startups, you know, but people are, you know, gathering together to work on something. And only that by itself is motivational. And then, you know, if, uh, you know, what each of these uh, things they are building can do to, I don't know, to a small community, to a big community, to whatever is their goals, that's, that's something significant worth uh, paying attention to and, uh, and giving feedback and gathering them in the right direction. Mm, definitely. Uh, so there is one thing that you posted uh, recently. I wanted to uh, to kick it off with that, uh, and I'm going to read it now. Uh, despite the high risk of failure in new ventures, engineers and business people leave their jobs because they are unable or unwilling to perceive how risky a startup can be. Um, Hyvars Business Review uh, said that, and you had a question, do you think VC-founded companies attract talented people by appealing to a lottery mentality? And uh, I don't see that many, uh, you know, thought-provoking questions and posts on LinkedIn. That's why this one got my, my attention. So let's get into it and talk a little bit about it. Sure. Uh, you know, I had... You ask what kind of person goes into a startup? What gives up the security and the sense of a regular paycheck for this sense of, you know, overwhelming pressure, uh, uncertainty in terms of security, uh, you know, exacerbated if you have a family to support, you know, the uncertainty of funding or, or earning money to live, etc. So it's like, it's a giant gamble. But do people perceive it as a gamble? And... Um, is it like blackjack? And you know, you, you, you play a few hands, you, you you lose, you keep playing until you win, or you, you give up the game and go and get a job doing something else. Um, and and for, from my own lens, it was very much a case of, well, age plays a huge determining part in this. I think if you're younger, well, sorry, let me reframe that. A friend of mine said to me, how do you, how do you decide whether you're gonna do something? It seems really risky, Taryn. You're gonna get into a startup. So I well, I'm still, quote unquote, young enough, I'm 49, I'm young enough to recover from a failure. That's how I look at it. It's not, will it fail? It's, can I recover and how quickly? So if you frame it that way, then it's not so much a lottery mentality, then it's a, it's a high risk, high return, high reward strategy, a bit like investing in cryptocurrencies, a bit like investing in some fringe stocks, etc. But there is a degree of calculation and there's an underlying expectation or an underlying sense of my own self capabilities and what I can what I can deliver in a situation. The other part is the unknown, which is the risk. But I'm not buying a lottery ticket hoping to 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 win and be part of a unicorn. But I think most startup founders want to build unicorns, and I think that's where we're yeah. different. I don't. I want to build a business that's sustainable, and you know, with Avon Games, we're doing that. But I'm not planning to be the next Ubisoft or the next Tencent or yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, I wouldn't tie it even to the, to the startup founders. I would tie it to the, to the today's youth in most mm -hmm. cases, like, uh, from what I'm seeing and I work with a lot of youngsters, uh, these days I'm a, I'm an ex, uh, like, um, youth educator and youth worker. Uh, and what I, what I see is the shift that happened, like, uh, when we were younger, uh, even me, who I'm 38, you are 49. And when we were younger, like we wanted to change the world, but seems like today's people, uh, especially youngsters, most of them just want to learn how to swim and get the most out of the curing state. That's something that, that keeps appearing in my mind when I look at how things are developing. Sure, there are exceptions, of course, that are actually have a big chance of changing the world because there are exceptions. It's not everybody that has that mindset. But um, things that comes to my mind is, you know, uh, I want to learn, earn a lot of money. I can do it by building a unicorn, by building a startup. And, and then basically everything I do, I turn towards that direction. And, you know, uh, I've been working with a lot of companies. Some of them wanted to be unicorns. One of them is actually on the way to become one. 
um, and it's a tech development company. And, and like I stopped working with them because I couldn't get results out of the structure in the company. And I didn't like the mindset, but it's the mindset that gets them to the results. So I'm kind of like now in the middle. What I uh, want to say is the mindset is um, fast forward, 10x growth. You know, they are all repeating that like a mantra inside the company. Now they have they have a, a, a great guy who was on my podcast, like Nikos Slavnic, who is CMO and who knows how to do it and opens each uh, new market every month, no matter how small it is. And that's how they, they keep growing. Uh, but it's all very much aggressive because Accenture is the Northern Star. And they are, you know, somebody that's coming from Serbia. Uh, and it's, you know, looking from our perspective, it's really admirable. On the other perspective, it's like, um, okay, maybe I want to get on the train for a couple of months and then I want to get, get off. You know, so uh, just a few thoughts around the topic. No, I, I completely agree. You're right. Everything is geared towards hyper growth and acceleration. But I think what's lost in that scramble is the realization that the process is catabolic. It actually consumes the core of the fabric of the company, the people, the resources that is actually consumed in in propelling it. I worked for um, a telecoms company for a number of years, and they went they went through a massive round of acquisitions. I think in the end of something like thirty five acquisitions in eight or nine years, which is an incredible number of acquisitions. And it's just it's just absorb, pick out the bits you want, discard the rest, and it's everybody is just working towards this this mythical event, which was the um, the IPO uh, when we listed, it was, it's, and don't get me wrong, I did very well out of that, so I'm not complaining, but it also gave me perspective that actually this process is great conceptually, but it's not great for the component parts. And like you, I had to distance myself um, from those kind of environments. And I think that's what really drove the creation of the conscious sale as a concept in the book, which is this idea that, you know, there are better ways of being when we conduct business and there are better ways to operate as individuals collectively in an organization it doesn't doesn't get in the way of capitalism but it means that we're more mindful and more present in what we're doing we're much more connected to the work that we're undertaking rather than it is as a means to get to a future state or in your case we were talking that unicorn status which is what everybody's pushing for and, and it's that realization that the value is here in the work you do in the moment, and it's not you will be successful in the future. Yeah, it's. I think we are the ones that appreciate the journey more than than getting to the goal. I mean, it's important to get to the goal, but while you are on the journey, you need to change yourself, change your environment, change the company to get to the goal. Yeah. And, and you know, and then all depends on you how much are you willing to change, and are you willing to change all those things. And all those, uh, you know, uh, rules that you put yourself on your behavior, on the way you act, on the way you work, on the way you live. You know, now we get into the Stoics. I have Marcus Aurelius somewhere here. <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to read the books on your, on your shelf, actually. But no, you're right, it is. And, and you know, I, I am an advocate of looking inwards rather than looking outwards. I, I think if you want to solve, if you want to fix the world, fix yourself. Yeah, because that's where you really make the difference. And that was, I've been on, um, I hate the expression because it sounds so trite, but on a journey, if you want to call it that, of self-development for the last so, 10 years, eight, 10 years, I was, I, I, I was forced into it through a very dysfunctional working approach and completely at odds with my own sense of well-being in, as part of this machine part in the company and in society. So it forced me to, 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 to really look inside. And I now recognize that a lot of people who want to go and change the world and get people to change their behaviors, I, I understand the intent, but I think if we start with ourselves, act as an example that is beyond reproach, you know, live by those values, it will ignite in the next person more powerfully than telling people they need to change because they're whatever they are doing or being or however they're not doing or being, etc. 
Love it. So let's let's get it, get into the you know uh, do we actually need to raise an investment and where where is the time when we actually need it? You know, because I, I I think we got into into uh, talking all around. I see maybe it's a, a little bit lower now while we are in let's say the crisis or it's just coming, but at least in Serbia, we can feel it a lot. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you actually need an investment? Because like working with a couple of now, uh, let's call them startups from the US outside of tech, maybe I can put them in a bracket of uh, like digital transformation of certain industries, like the moving industry or some others. Like, I see that companies getting money for something which is just copying a few things from different from other industries. Like we're going to be this uh, in our industry. We are going to be this in our industry, not going from the customers, developing something that is truly uh, important. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It was. Someone asked me that question about a year ago, and I said, well, you know, actually don't raise if you don't have to, because working with VCs or, or financiers just introduces a whole host of challenges and constrictions and, and um, considerations that you otherwise wouldn't have to deal with. But I guess if we go one step back and say, well, why, what kind of business do you want to grow? Okay, I think there's a romanticization about unicorns and, everybody strives to build a unicorn where i think people should try as they should my understanding is it's better to try and solve problems and do something really well from day one so it actually generates value for the person then you get paid for that value and then you scale that over time rather than use weight of effort energy and resources to build something up that will eventually be monetized in some way shape or form so what i guess i'm saying inarticulately is people are focused on building a tech behemoth rather than a business that solves a problem okay if you start with the position of i want to build a pro business that solves a problem for somebody usual avenues of family and friends and, and and the various different approaches to raising the capital to start that, I think it's great. If you have to go and raise money to get it beyond conceptual stage, then you're playing in a very different field. And unless you come from an Ivy League background, it's unlikely that you're going to get that back in. You know, that, that's my take on the situation. Yeah, but um, that's that's a good approach to it. Because like, uh, I see a look around me and I see like most companies, at least here in Serbia, uh, are managed to get like we were a tech development environment with a strong technology background. Uh, but now like for, we are shift, uh, kind of making a shift from outsourcing tech development to building the products and to be able to get the people that you need to build products basically uh you know for that you usually go and get the investment sure i mean listen but the investment is an integral part of the growth of the economy so exactly you asked me should we go and get it if you can avoid it avoid it to the last stage possible but there are going to be times where and and, and then this is the nuance and the difference investment is there to scale an already successful idea or business rather than there will always be the outliers where they're going to fund some research that may prove to be super super, super lucrative. But more than not, an investor wants to put money into something that will just make it get to where it's already going, but get there faster. That's it. I don't want to. I don't want to validate. I don't want to pay for your hypothesis validation. I don't want you to give you money so that you can go and find out if the market will or won't buy it. I want you to come to me and say that actually this is a situation that I happened across because I was working in it or B, I was falling into it through circumstances. And there's this inherent problem that, you know, I looked at it a hundred different ways. This is fixable. This is what the demand for it is because I've spoken to the people. They all say they would give me money to do this. I just need the capital to make that happen over a period of time. Now, if you can come to me with a credible 
insight into a situational problem that's solvable and demands being solved by the, the, the marketplace that you seek to serve, then that's when an investor go, yeah, I can see that. And then that opens up the conversation about, well, how big is that opportunity? Will I get 10x on my return? Because, you know, the, the rate of return on investment is about 85, 90% in favor of loss. So, you know, we have to win big on the ones that we do win big on. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just mathematics, right, from that perspective. Uh, and I think you actually answered my question, my next question that I was willing to ask. And it, it was like, uh, what are some, you know, simple ways to immediately improve your investment rates? Because like, but what you said, uh, if I can just uh, get one thing out of it is, you know, prove that something is working and you'll get the money to get it going and get it to the next level. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the beautiful things about the due diligence process, right? Because I, I'm an advocate, a staunch advocate of founders being the first salespeople of the company because no one is going to understand the nuance of the situation, the challenges, the problems, etc., as acutely. And no one's going to have as much skin invested in this outcome, successful outcome of what you're doing. So they're going to try on that. So, um, I've just lost my train of thoughts. Where were we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A founder as a, as a first guy that sells the product. So, the series. yeah. So the oh no, I have. I've just no. The point before that. Sorry, you can cut this out, I guess. But guys, uh, if you're listening now live, my apologies. I've just had a senior moment. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is. Um, Investment come uh, sorry when you invest in a company sorry when you're building uh, a company and you want to go and raise investment if you could show me the work you've done to validate the belief in that it's that it's that often on the pitch that we say oh I spoke to fifty people that isn't indicative of a marketplace that's a very low number of people and what I'm looking for is you to go actually I went a mile deep an inch wide into this market and in doing so. I had 500 conversations and 300 of those are going to be our first customers because we got so used to speaking and they got so comfortable in telling and they were so uh, uh, appeared so interested in the solution that I can go and say, hey, pick up the phone, I have this now, it's live, do you want to take it? And you've already built your preliminary market and your preliminary prospecting base as a consequence of validating the idea. Sorry, it took me a while to get there, but the, the point being that that's super valuable because it's a process. Then you go, okay, validation leads to sales. Sales leads to you know promotion of the value that you can then expect to get as an investor. So all of these things are critically intrinsic in the process of raising money. Yeah, it, it, you reminded me of uh, of a thing because. Uh, I was j just spending a, a half a day working things and like 30 minutes looking back on the things and seeing what we can improve. And like, you know, just hearing somebody say that, oh, we had like 50 conversations. Like when I uh, started Funky Marketing, I didn't know that we were going to go into the B2B. So uh, I just know that I had 9,000 9, collections on LinkedIn. I wanted to, to speak with as many of them to see what's out there. So I had like more or less 270 virtual coffees with people. And I saw that there is a gap in B2B that from what I know uh, and what I have experience seeing working in B2C, I can fill in. And basically just based on that, we went into the B2B and we closed... 59 clients in first 18 months, all organically on LinkedIn by focusing just on that, those things that I got from those conversations. And, and, you know, it's not always that easy, but I mean, it's not easy to have 217 conversations, right? It's, it's a lot of conversations to have yeah. to get to prove some, if something is just a hunch or that's actually a thing that is happening. But that's one of the things that distinguishes you from somebody else looking for an investment. So if, if I can find out what you're telling me by looking up on Google, then it's no value to me. But hopefully what you're coming to me with is a specific insight elicited from those conversations that have gone to the heart of a particular problem. 
you won't get that research anywhere on, on Google from a, from a browser search. That has to be, that has to be curated and nuanced from conversation. And then from the right body of people, I could speak to a thousand people, none of them are where I see. So if you're, if you're coming from that position, you're starting to look credible. You may not have a credible business, but you as an executor of a business looks credible, which is another component of what makes people investable, you know? Having a great idea and not being able to execute is the age old problem. Exactly, exactly. Um, let's see what are some, uh, you know, because I want to make it uh, practical. Let's get to a few small, simple advices that people can, you know, use to be able to optimize what they already have to be more approachable towards, you know, uh, raising an investment. What are some small, simple things that they can use maybe to talk about things in a different way, not just to present them differently? Uh, uh, it's always about the value of the solution yeah, to the person that you're solving it for. The size of the problem may be, um, something you see and not shared by the audience. So communicate the scale and the impact of the, of the solution on the market very clearly. And I think spend plenty of time getting, you know, a cross section of that feedback so you can distill it into a very salient, crisp, singular line. From, from the perspective of communication, most, most investors are looking for some kind of formalization in the deck. Um, that deck is merely a sales and marketing document. It's not to be it's not to be feared. It should be simple, and it should be the basis to get the next conversation. If you look at it that way, then you'll stop trying to put war and peace in the in the ten twelve slides. So keep the information in the deck to what's relevant. No more than two or three pieces of information. I need two pieces of information per slide. Every word has to count. Every word that you're going to utter, you should write down and then ask yourself, do the words I'm speaking, when the screen is, the slide is on the screen, does it relate? If it doesn't, why not change it? Can I say that one sentence more succinctly? Does the audience get it? Yeah, so take this critical approach of does it meet, do they match up? And is it really saying what I want it to say? When you've done that first draft, here's the killer one. What three things is one of my favorite tri uh, tricks for people to do? Find someone you trust to give an honest uh, feedback. Deliver the pitch, whether it's spoken or it's a pitch with a deck. Let them listen. And then when it's finished, ask them, what three things stood out the most about what I just told you? Because we often have an idea that we're really emphasizing one particular branch of communication, whether it's the problem or the solution or the profitability. But the audience will cue into what's most apparent to them. Now, one, one swallow doesn't make a summer. So you go and do that with two or three or four people. If you get the same thing over and over again, and it's not what you're looking for, you've got to change the content. But I think that's super powerful and anybody can do that with any materials they create. Yeah, there, there is there is one thing, uh, I mean, what you said matters and not only for like uh, sales decks, sales speeches, it works for any public speech, you know, that you are preparing. Um, there is one thing I was, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, because most of the uh, pitches begins with, uh, with two things. We are the name of the company. This is our team. And then they go to the problem. Uh, or they start with a problem and then they go and talk about themselves. Yeah. But they just, you know, announce the problem from the start. And there is uh, the third thing that I see started to, to get traction recently. Uh, and it is uh, like the strategic narrative thing where you get to show them like the bigger change and then you narrow it down to the problem and then you go, go further by that. What do you think, which of these things, uh, can we use? Where do we use each one of them and what's the best practice just by experience? Yeah, I think the strategic narrative piece takes time to unfold properly. 
And therefore, I don't think it has a place in your five minute pitch because you don't, you're creating a backstory and I'm not interested in your backstory. At that point, if you've got to frame it from the point of view, what, am I, what is the other person trying to get from that five minute, 30 minute piece of time? They want to decide whether they're going to invest another 30 minutes or an hour talking to you beyond that, right? So that's their point of view. So talking about the strategic narratives and your backstory is, is not appropriate. As far as I'm concerned, the very first slide that you create, if you're using a deck, or the very first thing that you communicate, spoken, um, should give me a sense of what's coming. The name of the business and a singular sentence that frames the industry, the disruption, the problem, something that goes, ah, oh, this is a business about this industry disrupting this problem or this benefit, something that I can then anchor my sense of awareness around and then everything follows from that. So I kind of like the, the, the first page giving me that foundation and going straight into the problem yeah, that I see and then the solution. I tell you that the whole team thing is only appropriate early on if there is a technical reason why your credibility needs to be established early so that it gives more credibility to the your, your, to the perception of your ability to execute. Because if you're saying, oh, we're going to build a, a quantum computer, we need $500 million, and no one's got a, a technology background, no one's an academic. It's like, so you kind of will establish that you're the right people from the beginning. So it's nuanced as to whether that needs to happen early or not, depending on the kind of business. But typically, I prefer that first five minutes to focus on the, the problem, the solution, how it's going to impact the, the market, the opportunity, et cetera, condensed into five minutes. After that, give me 30 minutes, and I'll tell you that story. And I'll give you more context, because data communicates stories, you know, make, make people remember. And that's how we, as humanity, have shared valuable information to storytelling. It's no coincidence that's happened. So that's a very powerful medium. And it also speaks to the type of person that you might have on the other side of the screen or in the room. Not everybody processes information in the same way. So if you have some nice, cold data, that's going to appeal to someone who's very left brain. If you're if someone who's a lot more, anal, more emotional in their, in their evaluation, they're going to want that story to connect with. So not everybody interprets information in the same way, nor are they going to take from it what you think is coming out of it. That makes sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Like adjust uh, the story, the presentation, everything towards the person who it is for, right? Yeah. And, and that's that's also the way I look at, for example, like strategic narrative. It's about when you create a category. It's not when you when you do a pitch for something for something else. So you need to have a context. It's to arm your salespeople to kind of spread the story around. Uh, and uh, Talking about, about sales, let's get a little bit into the those things where you wrote a book about, like about conscious, conscious sales and, uh, you know, um, the question that I want to ask you first is how can we actually improve the sales mindset? Because that, that seems to be like a generic question and I want to hear like where is your answer coming from? Where is the, the question taking you? Uh, sales, sales is like a small child that's been allowed to grow up without the right discipline. And it's become an unruly teenager and it's, it's proving to be difficult in the, uh, in, the, in the family unit of business, etc. So we're having some really bad practices playing out. So my answer is we, we need to go back to the way that we create salespeople. And before that, how we create human beings and how we prepare them. I think one of the things that I tried to do in the conscious sale was introduce mindfulness and mindset and presence awareness in a non-woo-woo type of way because salespeople were very critically cynical about these things and it sounds woo-woo when -woo, we dismiss it. But there's some really, really cold science in this that can't be refuted. And bringing a calm level minds sort of uh, awareness to the problems that we encounter or even the situations we encounter 
allows us to create a little space between the event happening and the way that we decide to respond to it. Because normally people react. It really just reacts to things. So we react to the difference in the market. We react to the competition's responses. We react to the sales manager having a go in. So rather than just stepping back and working from this foundation of car and saying, okay, look, none of this is a problem. It's just how do I optimize the results I get? Okay. If half of my energy is trying to manage these ideas that are spinning around in their heads, because a lot of the things that people deal with are completely below the radar for everybody else. We've all got this little voice in our heads, well, most of us do, and it doesn't always say nice things, and it doesn't always speak up when it should, and sometimes it doesn't shut up. So it's learning to understand how to harness your, your innate power to get things done from these three core tenets of being um, in an elevated state of being, be, making yourself more resilient and more energized than your normal baseline of operation. It's like climbing a hill, you can see further. If you're in a forest and you can't see the way out, but you climb a hill, you can see direction, it gives you a sense of purpose, it encourages you, so it's, 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 it's helpful. But most people live without intention, or we have an intention that's linked to some intangibility, so we talk about success. Success is not something to be appreciated or enjoyed in the future. It's something that you should experience in the now because it's a, it's a feeling. It can't be experienced any other time than in the present moment. So it's drawing people's awareness back to this present moment and how they can be more effective if they're completely connected with what they're doing than if they're thinking about, if I do this, I'll get to that goal. I'll get to my, my, my quarter number. I'll get to my commission check. So to make a better sales mindset is to first of all take a look at who you're being in this moment. Are you super noisy in your head? Are you always sort of flittering from one thing? Do you, do you, do you find that you are, your sense of well-being or how well you're doing is very much in the hands of other people? Do they determine how you feel by the critique or the positive endorsement they give you? All these things allow you then to start taking stock of where you are at this moment. And then you can start taking steps to regain your power. And it is genuine power because people can say stuff and it goes, well, it doesn't affect me like it would do before. So it's this process of self-awareness and then building practices that will help you become less aware of the ripples in life, the little road bumps that we might otherwise call disasters. And it allows us to actually become that much more engaged in what we do. And when we really engage with things, we tend to become more sticky as people. People tend to seek you out and want to have conversations with you because they find your, 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 your sense of focus really captivating. And then you start sparking with ideas with these people and you get proper connectivity, proper communion. And you talk to people in a much deeper way, which results in better relationships. Relationships are foundation of trust. Trust is what business is built on, and, and, and that allows you to quote unquote experience the success of being a salesperson. But it's not about the money, it's about that in the moment, getting that done, and everything else becomes a byproduct. There's a bit of a long winded answer there. No, no, it's a, it's a great one. It got, it got me into thinking of some of the things and prove some of the things that, you know, that it is there. Because, like, I always get back to myself, you know, I never consider myself as a salesperson, you know, but we're starting a company, I needed to sell. And I did it well because I did my research and I understood who I'm talking with. And I didn't want to actually sell to anybody. I wanted to build relationship with people. And, you know, there is, and there is one sentence that I was using. Um, I use it in, in Serbian, in English it would be, I would be un, enlightened to, to uh, hear, hear more about you. And there are people responding, nobody ever asked me. Nobody ever said they would be enlightened to hear about me and, and my life and my business and my work. You know, but it's just like that, you know, those things that got you uh, differentiated is that what you are saying is it trustful enough that they believe that you truly want that, that it isn't something behind it, as you said, for example, like the money or whatever it is? 100%. That's what I talk about as congruence. Because if you think about it, we as a human, as a species, we create on three different planes. We create at the level of thought. Nothing in the, in the world that has been made 
didn't start off as a thought. So everything starts as a thought, then it gets communicated verbally. We speak it, we share that thought with another, and we, we try and create more energy around building that into a reality. And then the final thing is our actions. We take action. We pick up the hammer, we cut the timber, we build the table, whatever it is. So when we're congruent of our thoughts, words, and actions, everything we do becomes amplified and becomes more uh, potent. When someone says one thing and they're thinking something else, there's that little uh, bullshit meter going on. I don't trust you, Mr. Salesman. I just think you're trying to get my money. And I think when... When salespeople stop treating customers as a means to get money, customers will try, stop treating people like they're trying to do that. You know, they'll stop seeing them as someone trying to take money from them, and because there's no baseline of trust. So I think you're hundred percent correct to, to to think that you you've got to have a common ground and somewhere to speak from before you even think about selling. Yeah. Uh... Look, I'm I'm uh, trying to get into into the B2B sales communities. There is one uh, now open in uh, for the people from Balkans, from Serbia, Rev Genius, and I'm just listening what's going on over there. And uh, and you know, most of the people have just one mindset that goes towards what they are doing. They don't look at you know at business from uh, who are different sizes. They don't look at the business from different industries, and then don't try to get uh, you know to learn a little bit from all sizes and to get better in what they do in their own industry or in their own niche. Like enterprise sales is totally different than the uh, you know when you are selling to the SMEs. It's totally different, uh, but still. You know, they will say what you are doing for the SMEs. If you are talking with somebody, two person salespersons selling to different people, they will say you are talking bullshit, and the other one will tell him you are also talking bullshit because they don't try to understand each other. And it's not only on that level; it happens also inside the company. And there are always those kind of silences happening again. But the thing that I notice is that the best salespeople are also good in marketing which means good at understanding who they are selling to, good at, uh, you know, they don't need to create content, but they know how to do it and they understand the value of it. And coming from the marketing side, what I see is that we marketers lack understanding of the sales function. So more than yeah. sales lacks of understanding of marketing function. Yeah, I, I think I'd be inclined to agree. I mean, Zineb and I have spoken endlessly on this topic. And it's, it's you know, yeah. I'm very much of the belief that sales and marketing are the same coin. It's the same coin, just opposite sides. You can't have one without the other in a, in a, in a well-functioning organization. And there has been very much a separation between, oh, historically, there's been a separation between the two. And they kind of acted independently of each other to the detriment of everybody in those departments. But I, I believe that, well, I didn't even realize some of the things I was doing in my sales role were marketing because they weren't being done by marketing as soon as I did. And then I, I kind of get reset on that. And I said, okay, so that's, that's the, there's the boundary I couldn't determine where sales began or ended and marketing started or stopped. And I think, you know, this is a controversial thought. I think LinkedIn is very much dominated by marketing rather than sales. I think it's probably 70, uh, 60, 40 split in terms of, and I think that a, a lot of the new wave marketers, and I'm gonna get shot for this, but I think a lot of the new wave marketers think they do, they're doing sales and they don't understand the difference between what sales actually is. It's not even how to do it, they just don't know what it is. They think what they're doing is almost sales and they miss the mindset. You don't need to have a tenacious and resilient mindset in marketing the way you do in sales when you're expected to make phone calls to people who may be having a bad day and see you as a convenient way of taking it out on someone. It's happened in every, every salesperson's life. They've had someone on the phone having a bad day and they unfortunately get the brunt of it. So there's, there's so many facets. And I think, you know, it's this cliche to say, go and spend a week or a month in someone else's department or another person's shoes. 
bloody good lesson that because it would be very interesting for both to see just what is involved beyond the the, the superficiality of the description and live the grassroots experience. Yeah, Milica, Milica had a comment, but before we get into that, uh, there is one thing that always associates me and it's totally out of the business context while I was studying uh, with a friend of mine. We were going from house to house working for uh, um, electricity distribution company, however it is in English, uh, yeah. but ba basically we needed to, to check the numbers, how much electricity did they spend per month. And, you know, get this down. It was first writing it down. Then we got some, uh, you know, some software devices. But anyway, what we needed to do each morning at 6, 7, 8 a.m. to get into the house, because, like, devices were inside the house, uh, and to, to get, uh, you know, the number. So we needed to learn first how to get into the, into the yard, uh, escaping the dog. Then we needed to, to wake those people up sometimes. Sometimes it's, I don't know, they are having argue inside it and we need to ring because we cannot come back tomorrow. Like, and this is where I learned how to communicate and how to uh, actually get myself inside somebody else's house as a stranger. You know, and, and I mean, you see there are a lot of different personalities, a lot of different people. Some of them even said, oh, you know, for the next month, the key is behind this stone. You just take it and you go. And, you know, wow. that's how much trust they some give you at the moment. What a great uh, training that was for you, though, because that's not common for everybody, right? That's a really good way of learning how to deal with people. Yeah, especially, you know, because, like, uh, my friend's uncle, was the main responsible guy over there in the company. And he count us as the ones that he can trust. So we needed to get in inside the houses of people that uh, own a lot of money for electricity, just to get the number so they can sue them. And, and basically there was a guy uh, who like, I don't know, it's five, six millions he owned. And everybody was talking like, oh man, don't even try to go there. Dogs are like, he is an angry guy. He can get a shotgun, whatever it is. He wasn't at home. There was no dogs. Like his wife opened up for us. We said, why we are here. She said, wait, I need to get the key. So we get upstairs. She unlocked the door. We need to get off our shoes. We get in. She unlocks another room. Then she removes uh, the bed. And inside the the locker, there's a there's a device, and I'm like, yeah. it's not that the guy is dangerous, but would I come back to do all these things another month? No, I would just keep it. Nice. <laughs> wow, That's incredible. Yeah, so I mean, you learn these things on a lot of different occasions, a lot of different stuff, and what I wanted to say, you never know what you know until you get in the position that demands you to show it. But, you know, that goes back to what we were talking about, about being present. And I 100% agree, by the way. And I had a similar kind of education in retail years ago when I started working uh, in, in, my first, in my first job. But it's, it's not reacting to the situation and having the presence of mind to go, what the hell is going on here? How do I play this? And not just being a non-player non -player character in a game and just sort of going through the motions. It's like, actually, I've got to take control. I've got to get past this level. Life is a computer game, right? <laughs> so it is yeah. a computer game. You are constantly interacting with other characters, overcoming challenges. And, you know, I actually refer to gaming in the, in the conscious style. So, you know, gamers don't want to complete the game easily. They want challenge. They want repetition. They want to be able to feel like they've accomplished something. And I think that speaks to human nature. We don't want to do things easily. And there is an easier way to do things quite frequently, but we want to go through the struggle and we want other people to recognize that we struggle. Okay, it's super interesting. And when you understand how people think like that, 
you can give them what they want whilst getting, I mean, that sounds manipulative, but I'm saying that you don't have to make it difficult to get the results that you're looking for. Totally agree. Uh, now, really get, just, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she said it's necessary to understand your customers' thoughts and objectives in order to align with your offer and support that you can provide them. Call it sales or better collaboration in order to succeed. Uh, it will help you also determine if you're the right fit, right? Yeah, totally. I, I think that that's, I've, I've commented this a number of times. Businesses that are successful play to what their customers need and say and want rather than what they want to say and do yeah lots of you can see lots of companies doing what they want and i'm a founder and i'm doing this but it's the ones that respond to the market most closely and i think it comes back to what i was talking i, I think it may be one of your posts i commented on cult telecom city of london telecom were a challenger telecom operator in london i don't know i'll probably get this wrong now 20 plus years ago and the the, the main incumbent was british telecom cult comes along and they're fresh, fresh, fresh air. They're doing everything right. They're talking to their customers. There's a process beyond the order form. Everything is like right. And they were like, they were the golden story. Cut to 15 years later, they've grown in size. They're as big as they've lost all their agile, nimble response. They've lost what made them great in pursuit of the idea of what they should be, rather than what the customers need them to be. So I think I think that speaks to what uh, is being said in the comment there. Yeah, mm, I mean, look, it's been a great conversation. We've been back and forth with a lot of different thoughts, and I really like where we where we ended up. Just looking at back where we started, we we agree that this is going to be a freestyle because of. Lack of preparation from my side, but uh, I knew what it I wanted. It's a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, I knew what I want to get. And basically, uh, for everybody listening, that's usually how I set up these conversations. I go to somebody, to a guest profile. I check their about section. Uh, I check at the 10 latest posts and I see what they're most passionate about because I already know why I invited them on the podcast. And then I just get a couple of thing, topics that they are most passionate about and I go over them and then we, we jam and we get into some, some of those different stuff. But I like to, uh, to go like this because that's how we get the most of the conversations. We don't know where it's going to take us. Beautiful. Uh, Taran, my man, thanks for, for being here. Thanks for, uh, joining the show. Uh, if we have done it like a month ago, I would probably tell you that we're going to drink something on the New Year's Eve in Barcelona, but I switched plans in the meantime. That's what I did last New Year. So yeah. maybe uh, a year after this, uh, but uh, I very much uh, want to leave an open door to invite you. We're going to start business talks uh, networking here already uh, going on. And uh, I would like you to join us on one of the conferences we're going to organize so uh, people from, from this side of the world, from the tech community, can get to know you and uh, learn a few things from your experience. I'll be honest. Thank you very much. That would be fantastic. And thank you very much again for the invite. It's been great talking with you and we've had a great conversation. Likewise. So tell me and the people where they can find more information about you. We'll leave it in the description, but just for those that are listening to the audio. Sure. So if you're interested in sales mindset, you can check out my YouTube channel. It's not particularly vast or expensive, but I have created quite a lot to help people with sales and sales mindset stuff on the conscious sale on YouTube. You can find me on LinkedIn also um, under my own personal brand, and you will see links to the companies I'm involved with like Pitch Slack. If you're a tech founder looking for feedback on how to improve your pitch, etc., cetera, um, reach out, connect, say hi. It'd be great to speak to you all. Yeah, guys, make sure you do that. And before all that, stop, go back to the beginning of this episode. Uh, listen, uh, as I always say, stop at the moments when you feel like we said too much in a short period of time. Uh, consume it. Go back to, to Taran, ask him some questions on LinkedIn. Uh, uncover everything that we said. I mean, this is all with a goal to make you better at what you do. And... For the end, uh, to everybody, just 
as we always say for the end, keep it funky. Have that little extra edge to whatever you do. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks.